Hello everyone, what's up, it's Luke here, welcome to my May the 4th special for this year. With The Rise of Skywalker having been released and canonically concluding the Star Wars saga, I think it's time to reflect on the Star Wars sequel trilogy. However, before I discuss the movies themselves, I shall quickly recap what led to Disney buying Star Wars and the sequels coming into existence in the first place. In 1999, 16 years after the release of Return of the Jedi, George Lucas revisited Star Wars' cinematic tales with the first installment of the eagerly anticipated prequel trilogy, Episode 1 The Phantom Menace. It was a massive pop culture event at the time. However, an immense portion of the fan base didn't like The Phantom Menace. The common complaints people have with the movie being the story, the immense use of computer-generated imagery, the stale acting, the character of Jar Jar Binks, a heavy focus on politics, and the pod race. Now admittedly, that last complaint is kind of split. There are some people who dislike the pod race, and there are others who like it. The main problem most people seem to have with that was how long the race lasted, which I personally don't see a point in having a problem with, but back on point. Fast forward three years later to 2002, and the second prequel came our way, Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. This movie has some of the same echoed complaints that The Phantom Menace had, so the story, the immense use of CGI, and the stale acting. However, the complaint that most AOTC haters tend to harp on is the romance scenes between Anakin and Padme. Fast forward another three years to 2005 and the final prequel movie came out, Episode 3 Revenge of the Sith. Whilst prequel haters somewhat concede that Revenge of the Sith is an improvement over its respective predecessors, hardcore original trilogy fans really don't praise it all that much, and the more over-dramatised or melodramatic um, moments of the film, like Darth Vader's no! scene, well, yeah, they just love to harp on that. However, after a good seven years of George Lucas enduring post-prequel era hate, during which time three of the most infamous videos on these films came to be, Fast forward three years on from the year in which those abominations came to be, and George Lucas sold Star Wars to Disney for $4.05 billion on October 30th of 2012. Now it's time to talk about the movies that this deal yielded. Just under two years after Disney's purchase of the Star Wars IP, we received the first teaser trailer for Star Wars' cinematic return, The Force Awakens. I think it's quite obvious looking at the trailer that Disney and Lucasfilm wanted TFA to be a return to form, as it were, for fans of the franchise, and I know this next thing may sound quite mean, however I honestly believe that appeasing die-hard OT fans who despised the prequels was the top goal for Lucasfilm concerning this particular cinematic outing. And believe me when I say you don't have to search all that far to find prequel hate on the internet. All three trailers for TFA were not afraid of frequently shoving nostalgia in people's faces. An example of which is how the trailers for TFA gave the impression that the original cast would have prominent roles again. Also, I know this may not be 100% relevant, but you know when I chucked that hint of shade at Red Letter Media's prequel videos? Well, the essence of those reviews, or smears, whatever you want to call them, chose to carry on, or rather they were carried on, in the months leading up to The Force Awakens, when you had people like Jeremy Jarns, Chris Stunkman, Nostalgia Critic, and others who chose to take their turns bashing the prequels leading up to the release of TFA. 
Heck, at the beginning of his TPM review, Chris Stunkman openly shouted out Red Letter Media's review of the film, and even went so far as to say that Red Letter Media's TPM review is probably his favourite movie review of all time. It's almost impossible for me to review this movie without giving a humongous thank you and shout out to Red Letter Media because their review for The Phantom Menace is quite possibly my favorite movie review of all time. If that's not a sign to you as to how bafflingly influential these reviews have been in the YouTube prequel hate circuit over the past 11 years now, I don't know what is. Anyway, I'm going to skip straight to when The Force Awakens arrived on the scene and the impact it had on critics and fans alike following its release. <laughs> Star Wars, nothing but Star- Alright, hold on, this is taking forever. That's right, kids, my old Star Wars curtain cape. Had a forever video where I talked about the trailers, I might as well have it for the movie review. Star Wars Episode 7, The Force Awakens! <laughs> Basically, the movie, so good. As you can tell, The Force Awakens went down well in the immediate aftermath of its release. Something that really does bug me though is how prequel hate was back in the limelight even after the movie came out. Several critics couldn't make it throughout their respective reviews on TFA without bashing the prequels even once. George Lucas created Star Wars and then he destroyed it. <laughs> Let's be honest with the prequels. Is it better than the original films? No. Is it better than the prequels? A Thousand times. Ah. You knew there was going to be a lightsaber fight in this movie. It's great. It's great because it's not super choreographed. It's not flashing. It actually is a movie with filmmaking and acting and scenes and characters. <laughs> Things we haven't seen in a Star Wars movie in a really long time. With that aside, TFA was the dawn of the divisive state that the Star Wars fandom is in now. I think a lot of that stems from how the plot of TFA is eerily similar to A New Hope, and another big issue I think TFA has is how the original characters were treated, and they, let's be honest, come on, they weren't handled very well. Having Han and Leia regress back to regress to being estranged over their son falling to the dark side makes it feel as though the bond they developed in the original trilogy had all been for nothing. Actually, there lies another problem in the copycat category with The Force Awakens. If The Force Awakens wasn't copying the original films, it was stealing from the post-Return of the Jedi stories of the old expanded universe, now known as Legends. You know, the very expanded universe that Disney and Lucasfilm wiped away the entirety of to make way for new stories, including this new film trilogy? And just to prove my point to you here, Kylo Ren was the son of Han and Leia. He was initially under the training of Luke within his new Jedi Order, but then fell to the dark side due to the seduction from Supreme Leader Snoke. Then, if you look at it on the EU side of things, and bear in mind the EU was only decanonized the year prior to The Force Awakens being released in theaters, you have Jason Solo, the son of Han and Leia and the nephew of Luke, who started out as a recruit in Luke's New Jedi Order, but eventually lost his way and fell to the dark side due to the seduction of the Dark Lady of the Sith, Lumaya. You see what I mean in terms of how the sequels were trying to copy Legends and get away with it? Oh, and there is something else that served as the straw that broke the camel's back. However, we'll get to that. Then we come to Luke Skywalker, who, despite his disappearance being the entire grand focus of the film, is only given half a minute of screen time at the end of The Force Awakens, if that. However, that only begins the salt in the wound that the sequels gave fans of Luke Skywalker. 
Then you have Ray. I'm sure an overwhelming amount of the fan base already knows about the Mary Sue allegations that have been leveled against Ray, and with all due respect to sequel fans, it's not easy to argue otherwise. She was able to pilot the Millennium Falcon effectively in mere seconds, she was able to use the Jedi mind trick despite having only just tapped into her force potential when she did that. It also doesn't help that she didn't even see a force wielder use that power before doing it herself. Then you have the duel at the end of the film, where Rey, despite having no understanding of how a lightsaber works, was able to defeat Kylo Ren by simply tapping into her force potential. Let alone that the former is a student of both Luke and Snoke, and should have wiped the floor with Rey instantly, but... Yeah, that, uh, that that didn't happen. I guess you could say that TFA started off as a gift from heaven and then fell into being decisive, at, divisive as time passed. However, the impact TFA left on the fandom, that was a mere warning sign of the approaching storm. Now we fast forward to December of 2017, where we come to The Last Jedi. If The Force Awakens threw rocks that caused smear marks on the window that is the Star Wars fandom, then TFA was the boulder that came right through and shattered the window in half. There are a number of factors that many fans didn't like about TLJ. Common examples being the pace of the film feeling very drawn out, unfitting uses of humour, Leia's forced flight moment, the soft antagonism from Vice Admiral Amalyn Holdo, and her insistence on keeping the battle plan to Poe confidential throughout the film, the very jarring tonal shifts, the very prominent role that Rose Tico played, Snoke's extremely abrupt death, Ray's Mary Sue elements having been amplified tenfold, and say it with me now, the character assassination, metaphorically speaking, of Luke Skywalker. Of all the problems TLJ has, and bear in mind the ones I listed were some of the most common complaints you hear, the way that Luke is treated in this film, that's the one which claws at my heart the most. While Anakin will always be my number one Star Wars hero, I am also a big fan of Luke Skywalker. However, the first thing that really had me thinking, hmm, something's going on here, was when Luke casually tosses Anakin's lightsaber over his shoulder. That lightsaber is the heirloom of the Skywalker family, a symbol of the legacy that the Skywalker family engraved on the galaxy, the lightsaber formerly owned and wielded by his father, the prophesied Chosen One. Yet Luke just tossed it aside, like it was nothing. As if that wasn't bad enough, then we have Luke acting like a miserable grouch throughout the film. However, they then pulled the ground from under us immensely by revealing that Luke initiated Ben Solo's fall to the dark side by briefly contemplating whether or not it's worth outright murdering Ben Solo because he sensed a glimpse of the dark side in his student. Okay, so, at the end of Return of the Jedi, Luke's fighting Darth Vader, the second most tyrannical villain of the Star Wars universe at that time. We see Luke briefly struggle with temptation to kill his father after Vader threatened Luke with the possibility of Leia becoming a servant of evil. Luke's righteous fury was being motivated further by Darth Sidious, However, after a moment of contemplation, Luke ultimately resisted his anger and tossed his own lightsaber aside, 
swearing to not kill his father and resisting the temptation of the dark. So Luke was able to prevent himself from falling over the edge at the last possible moment and cause Darth Vader's redemption, yet 30 years down the line, a glimpse of the dark side in his sister and best friend's son, his own nephew, instantly warrants potentially killing him? What's with this illogical change in Luke's mentality? But that's not even the worst part. The worst part is coming up. The final major thing I want to talk about here is the way Luke dies. So at the end of The Last Jedi, during the Battle of Krayt, the Resistance are trapped, and it seems like all hope is lost. Yet Luke decides to come out of hiding and participate in the battle. He makes his way out to the battlefield and is subjected to blaster fire from the First Order AT-80s. I know they're called ATM-6s, but come on people, they're at-ats. Luke and Kylo find themselves in a face-off, and after a brief exchange in which Luke confirms to Kylo that Luke will not be the last Jedi, we have the moment where Kylo rushes at Luke, mauling him, as it were, or so it seems. Kylo turns back to Luke and pierces Luke's chest, only to discover that Luke is a force projection, which infuriates Kylo. Then we cut back to Akto, and we see Luke shortly after his projection faded away, um, and we see that Luke couldn't bear the strain of the force projection to the point where it just kills him. I'm sorry, but if you're gonna kill off a legacy character within your franchise who has been there since the very beginning, you have to make them go down, you have to give them a death that fits the character. You have to have them go down like a, like a hero, otherwise when they bite the dust, their death will mean nothing. And all Luke's death did for me was just wind me up, because having Luke fade away like that, yes, it's a beautiful image with the son of Krayt on Luke's face as he ultimately passes on and becomes one with the Force, but I was expecting him to die in battle and go down like a blooming hero, and that's not what we got. And I genuinely hope that Disney and Lucasfilm take the public outcry that occurred as a result of how they treated Luke in TLJ to heart as a reminder of what happens when you shatter a legacy character and invert their core to where they're hardly recognisable. Anyway, I shall move on. Now we come to the calendar year just gone. It was in April of 2019 that the first Episode 9 teaser trailer was revealed at Star Wars Celebration, during which there were a couple of key moments, the first of which being the appearance of Lando Calrissian, and the second of which were the remnants of the original Death Star from Return of the Jedi, which was completely obliterated at the end of that film, so why are there still remnants of it? Uh, but then, of course, we get this moment. <laughs> There's the return of Palpatine. In short, that detail within Rise of Skywalker makes it a poor man's version of the classic EU story, however controversial it may be, Dark Empire. For those of you who aren't aware, the big draw of Dark Empire was indeed having the Emperor return. So if you are an EU hater, or you hate Dark Empire, well, 
You EU haters no longer have valid ground on which to complain about the Emperor coming back in Legends because the new canon is guilty of the exact same thing. On the whole, Rise of Skywalker has gone down as a mixed conclusion to the sequel trilogy. Anyway, now that I've said what I want to say about the films, I shall go on to talk a little bit about how the sequels have impacted the fandom itself. Simply put, the sequels are probably the most controversial subject in the Star Wars fandom. Ever since The Last Jedi, the fandom has gone through a major split. In one corner you have the hardcore Disney canon fans, and I'm specifically talking about the fanboys of the sequels, the best example I can think of to prove the fanboyism would be Mark Hamill's hashtag missed op opportunities tweet in which he posted a picture of Luke, Han, Leia and Lando in the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon together. The controversy that this tweet stormed up was beyond unnecessary. I mean, I'm sorry, but the fact that you're willing to defend the new generation to the death so much to where you'd disrespect an innocent tweet Mark Hamill made is insane in my book. That said, haters of Disney Star Wars aren't one to talk either. On another side, you have the fandom menace. This side of the fandom practically embodies being unable to let go. Even if this is a bit of a shallow example, I'm going to put my neck on the block and use it regardless. So, the date... Uh, was November 23rd of 2019, and I was watching a, a live stream that B Level and Dark Snowvia were doing on Ewoks Unhinged, where they reacted to a mindless entertainment video. Mindless entertainment, for the benefit of anybody who doesn't know, is part of the fandom menace, and that stream ended up getting the attention of big name fandom menaces. So we're talking the like we're even talking geeks and gamers here people but the menacer who uh well the big menacer anyway the first big menacer that the stream ended up getting the attention of was comic artist pro secrets the aforementioned live stream went into the early hours of the morning uh, in my area and then came the daytime uh, and I looked up Comic Artist Pro Secrets YouTube channel and his newest video at the time was this one, by which time The Last Jedi was already 23 months old. If that isn't even a slither of a sign to the uninitiated that the fandom menace can't let TLJ go, I don't know what is. However, then you've got people who are kind of in the middle. So they aren't head over heels in love with the sequels, but don't hate them with the passion of Tatooine's twin sons, and are finding enjoyment uh, through other means of Star Wars. So like me, for example, I'm delving into the archives of the original Expanded Universe, now known as Legends, but drawing attention back to the sequels themselves as I close out this video, some people call these three films the fan fiction trilogy, others call them the counterfeit sequel trilogy. For me, I'll simply refer to it as the copycat trilogy. Dark Snowvio mentioned in his review of The Rise of Skywalker, so credit goes to him for bringing this up, that it wouldn't surprise him if the sequels end up being banned from forums one of these days. Who knows, they very well could be. In summary, from rehashing the original trilogy and the classic expanded universe to butchering the original heroes so that they are mere skeletons of their former selves, the sequels were a controversial period for the Star Wars fandom, and it's clear that, that the scars that the sequel trilogy left on the fanbase won't leave the memory of any of us who experienced this period of Star Wars anytime soon. Anyway guys, that's going to do it for me. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys with a more positive video tomorrow. Until then, goodbye, you've been warned, and may the fourth be with you.